Est-ce que vous n'êtes pas un peu flemmard au premier rang Ou je me trompe Monsieur Vetterli, il y en a trois devant vous. Ah, ça me rassure. C'est le moment de discussion de cette euh, cérémonie. Euh, J'invite les orateurs à venir... J'ai fait ça toute la soirée. J'invite les orateurs à venir me rejoindre sur scène. Et en particulier, Madame Déborah Bloom, rédactrice en chef du magazine Undark. Euh, C'est elle qui va être la modératrice du panel. Et j'espère qu'elle est dans la salle. Elle fait où, la main Ou elle ne fait pas elle ne fait pas. Bon, il n'y a pas de modératrice, on va s'en sortir. Hein. Si, si, ah, vous êtes là. Mais il y a également Francesca euh, Unsworth, rédactrice en chef News pour la BBC. Nathalie Wappler, directrice de SRF. C'est la chaîne suisse alémanique euh, de la SSR, donc de la télévision nationale. Monica Bauerlein, directrice de Mother Jones. Géro un homme. Jérôme Fenolio, directeur du Monde. Et... Ouzo Iweala, directeur d'Africa Center. Merci beaucoup de me rejoindre sur scène. Pendant que vous vous installez, je, vais vous dire, je vous ai dit que je vous donnerai des informations trépidantes. L'apéritif, je sais que vous l'attendez. Alors l'apéritif sera lieu juste après ce panel. Et puis euh, un petit moment de folklore suisse encore pour terminer. Comme ça vous savez à combien vous en êtes du moment où vous allez manger et boire des coups. C'est dans... 45 minutes, une heure. Comme ça, vous êtes à peu près au, au courant. Et je vais donner la parole à, à madame. Amusez-vous bien. En tout cas, j'espère. Moi, j'écouterai derrière. Hein. Thank you. Je vous en prie. Thank you. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to this plenary panel with some of the leading editors of publications in the world to discuss the question, uh, science journalism in the mainstream media, a luxury or a necessity. Before we start, I want to briefly do a couple of definitions and then I'm going to turn to the panel once I sit back down and, and ask them to talk about some of those definitions. But I want to make it clear starting on that my own definition of science journalism is not science promotion, is not making us necessarily making us feel good about science, is not too close to science. Science journalists are important because we do independent inquiry into science. We stand for a clear-eyed vision of science, how it works, what it accomplishes, what it may not accomplish. And we explore that, we explain it, We illuminate it, we tell stories in which the audience that we have is not even necessarily the scientists. At our best, we're illuminating it, that, it for people in the everyday, or for po policy makers, or for people who are afraid of science, and we want to bring them a little closer in because This is my personal prejudice, and I say this constantly. Science and technology are two of the most form forceful and powerful forces transforming the planet. If we don't understand them, if we don't know how to navigate the world as they change them, then we are in real trouble. And one of the things that science journalists can do well is provide to everyone else with a kind of clear-sighted, independence and sense of integrity, the tools for navigation as we move forward today. Now, obviously that's my bias. And obviously from that position, I'm going to argue that science journalism is always a necessity rather than a luxury. But not everyone may agree. And so one of the things I want to do is ask uh, our panelists, and I'm going to start with you as well, Define a necessity. You publish a magazine that is about, it's Ventures Africa. It looks to make people understand and to illuminate the, ch the changing Africa, the gifts of Africa, the progress of Africa. In what context in that is science necessary? Well, oh, hi, everybody, um, and thank you, Deborah. I, you know, I think the, the, the idea of, of science being necessary, I mean, I, I, would, I would agree with you 100%, and I would say that within the context of a changing African continent, I mean, 
um, you can look at two things. One, the way that um, the way that science and the way that the continent itself has influenced the development of science and technology outside the continent, and then two, you can look at um, the way that technology and science have had a, a profound impact on Africa's transformation within the last couple of years. I mean, say the last two decades. Um, and I think that you know, is reporting on science and technology a necessity? Absolutely, yes. Especially when it comes to reporting on the changes that are happening. I think one of the things that you have to be clear about and careful about is the way in which those stories get told. And I think a lot of times those stories, especially in reference to Africa, if you look at mainstream media and publications around the world, tend to either, um, they tend to follow sort of the way that narratives about the continent have been, you know, from the beginning, which is like that the continent is a recipient, it's not an actor in its transformation, that cell phones come from outside and they transform Africa as opposed to Africans on the ground seeing a tool, which is what everyone in the world does, and using that tool to transform their lives. Um, there's so many things, and I don't want to, you know, we've got a lot of people to speak, but there's so many things like that, that's a very concrete example, that, that when we talk about how we speak about the continent and science and its importance on the continent, I mean, I think we have to be very aware of all of those kinds of stories and the tropes that we tend to fall into. And that's what we're trying to change with Ventures Africa. So Fran, BBC covers Africa and covers science. Do you worry that you fall into the obvious descriptions of science and Africa as being something that we are handing to Africans? How do you manage that kind of image and science? Well, I, I, I used to run the World Service, so in fact we were very committed to covering science in Africa, and of course we actually have 300 journalists in Nairobi working for the BBC, and another 150 in Lagos, so it, it's, I don't think it's that sort of paternalistic approach, it's coming from them themselves. On, on the substance of your, of, of your question, I mean, it would be, um, I think if I said that science journalism wasn't a necessity, I'd probably get lynched in this group of people <laughs> and would probably have to go home quite quickly. But of course, it is a necessity. It's actually moved far more centre stage science journalism than in the past. And I think it it's something about how we live in very anxious times. People uh, are anxious about their lives, but also it underpins so many of the stories which are generally considered to be politics or economics. So if I think of the big stories that um, you know, we've been covering in, in Britain over the past few months, you know, the Skripals, the attempted murder of the Skripals mm. in, uh, uh, in Wiltshire, um, Hampshire, was actually, we needed our science journalists as part of this story, which ran at the top of bulletins day after day. Huawei, the row between the US and China over whether the Chinese should be allowed into 5G networks looks like a sort of business geopolitical story, but actually we need a science dimension to it. And that's why science coverage is center stage. Also for all the reasons previous speakers have said, you know, it's about helping people make informed decisions about their lives, which underpins democracy. And would you agree with that, Jerome? I know you um, at Le Monde have a good 20 people dedicated to different aspects of science, but do you see science taking center stage necessarily? And if you did, are there stories that you would put a premium on? Alors, je vais d'abord euh, euh, avoir une originalité. Je vais vous répondre en, en français comme on est à Lausanne et que je dirige un journal. Euh, qui n'a pas de version anglaise euh, pour défendre la francophonie, je, je me permettrai de vous répondre en, en, en français. Je, je pense que la pire erreur que puisse faire un directeur de journal aujourd'hui, ce serait d'avoir un service des sciences qui rétrécit avec moins de personnes. Je pense qu'aujourd'hui, l'enjeu qu'il y a à avoir une, un service des sciences étoffé, euh, c'est pas seulement une défense de la science, c'est la défense d'une méthode de travail. C'est extrêmement important de se dire qu'aujourd'hui, euh, la méthode scientifique, il faut la défendre parce qu'elle ressemble aussi à la méthode journalistique, en fait. C'est une technique, ce sont des techniques pour établir des faits, ce sont des techniques de discussion entre des pairs, il y a beaucoup de parenté entre les deux. Et c'est au-delà de raconter des découvertes, c'est défendre l'établissement des faits. Aujourd'hui, dans nos démocraties, c'est ça qui est attaqué. Et je pense que plus que jamais, 
il faut construire aussi des journaux autour des services de science, en fait, parce que ils incarnent quelque chose dans la méthode qui est commun aux sciences et au journalisme et qui est une des choses les plus importantes à défendre. I agree with that, and, uh, and, and just briefly going off track, one of the issues that I've been wrestling with myself is uh, trust in science. So, as science journalists, We expect our, we are used to quoting scientists and having people believe what they say. But increasingly, we see a reaction from the public. This plays out in vaccines, this plays out in climate change, where there's a hesitancy to take the word of the scientist as truth. And in fact, uh, one of the speakers here, Naomi Oreskes, has a book coming out this fall called Why Trust Science? that walks through a number of case studies that have led people to, to doubt it? Do you, is that one of the things you're saying? Do you see that as a problem that needs to be overcome? Oui, oui, oui c'est exactement ça. C'est-à-dire qu'il faut vraiment arriver à rétablir la confiance. Et pour rétablir la confiance avec les lecteurs, il faut établir une méthode, il faut défendre la méthode. Et c'est ça qui est attaqué aujourd'hui par les adversaires de la science. C'est la méthode de réflexion scientifique. C'est pour ça que je pense qu'il est absolument important dans les journaux d'avoir des services des sciences qui non seulement défendent la science, mais défendent aussi cette rationalité-là. Alors vous allez dire que c'est peut-être un peu français, on est le pays de Descartes, etc. Mais il faut absolument euh, avoir un discours de la méthode journalistiquement. Et c'est pour ça que je pense que les chercheurs... Et les, euh, et les journalistes ont une cause commune. C'est cette méthode qui permet de chercher la vérité. And do you see that too, Monica? You work at a publication, Mother Jones, that really tends to focus at science, uh, uh, that sort of intersection of politics and policy. So you tend to often write, you have a, a, a climate change desk. You tend to focus on these issues that do draw this kind of doubt. Is this something you see? Do you have plans in place? Does it cause you to think we should cover something else? Yeah, now does not seem to be the time to cover climate change um, <laughs> anymore. Let's just back off. Uh, no, I mean, Joan Fenoglio really um, stole my thunder because we have found ourselves having to open the box more and, sh and no longer demand that people um, trust scientists or trust journalists, but to show our work and, you know, create greater transparency and the, you know, kind of titanic struggle that you see at the moment in the United States and many other countries between demagoguery and propaganda on the one hand and the search for truth, even, in con even inconvenient truth on the other, depends very much on giving our audiences the tools to see why the methods that we're using and the questions that we're asking are legitimate, as opposed to just asking for their trust. And as well, it, with the Swiss television network, do you run into those kinds of challenges, Natalie? Yes, um, I mean, uh, we had in Switzerland uh, the initiative uh, about our finance system, and so we learned that we have to explain much better what we are doing. And I think that's the same kind of thing um, in science journalism. So we have to explain better how science works and how science journalism works. So how we get to our results and and um, and this is a new kind of storytelling and this needs to, to get back uh, the trust in science and in, in science journalism. And I want to come back to you in just a minute, Fran, but it was a last year at, or two years ago at the World Conference of Science Journalists, one of the sessions was on a movement in Africa to back away from science because it was a colonial artifact. And there was pushback in some schools, in fact, arguing that we should not be forced to study European science. So I'm wondering is when you cover science, do you also run into some of this trust issue? I mean, I think that, you know, it's interesting. I am the African on stage, so I'll get all the Africa questions. But, <laughs> um, you know, I represent all of the continent. Um, all of the continent. All of it. Um, Look, I think the thing to go to rather than that question, I think it's to think about it within the broader context of people's trust in, in storytelling in the media, trust in scientists themselves. Um, and I think what we're really seeing now is first, 
you look at the way that information is disseminated and people having much more access to information. So, you know, for example, I'm a physician, right? And if you think about mm -hmm. what happens in the, in the exam room, you know, people come in with all kinds of access to information that they didn't have before. And therefore, there's a, there, they just have more information that they wouldn't have gotten and they have questions. And people in positions of power often, are often not equipped to answer those questions in ways that are satisfying because they've never been asked those questions before. They've never had their authority challenged. I think it's a similar thing that you see um, when people start questioning the need or, you know, this question you asked about, um, you know, should we back away from colonial science or whatever? I think what you see is a lot of times in the West, people are very, um, get very testy when positions, when sort of like power structures are challenged. So if somebody comes up and says, this has not benefited us, or this has been, been detrimental to us, or you know, you've stolen from us in a certain way or whatever, I think people get very testy and seize, they, they don't really look at the underlying question or the underlying challenge beneath, which is how can you include me in this discussion. And I think that's what's really important. I think that's what we're all talking about up here, which is when you guys speak about it from your perspectives, and I you know, speak about it from my African or US perspective, whichever one, right? Um, I think the question becomes for us as people who are both journalists and also in some cases scientists, um, and this is, this is something that I saw when I wrote this book on HIV AIDS in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. People really want to be included in discussions about their future. And when they're not, that's where trouble starts. I think that's an excellent point. Did you want to follow up on any of those issues, Fran? Well, I, I think trust in science is probably not that different from trust in just about every institution that we used to trust. So we don't, you know, the public don't trust teachers, they don't trust uh, doctors, they don't trust the clergy, they don't trust the BBC, <laughs> they, you know, the list is endless. And, and I, I don't know that, that scientists are particularly singled out for a lack of trust, but of course the consequences are probably greater. I mean, not always, but they could be. And so this is an issue. But I also feel that this is really where, in a way, there's almost possibly too much science coverage. People get confused. They don't know how to read it. They don't know, um, you know, the ordinary member of the public cannot bring any kind of knowledge of stats to bear on what they're looking at. They don't know about sample sizes. And I guess, I, you know, I'd make a plea that's really supporting uh, the points that have been made. It's why you have to have science desks because, and, and why people need, you need to employ people with expertise who can do this on behalf of the public. It's really important to try to make sense of of some of this stuff, you know, the British papers are full of don't eat, you know, burnt toast, it'll give you cancer. Too much bacon gives you cancer. Don't take the statins, do take the statins. Right. Uh, don't take HRT, do take HRT. People are terribly confused by all these, these surveys that come out, these, these reports, and we need people to interpret it for them. So are, is, is this suggesting that we are doing a bad job at not, uh, what do I want, moderating the amount, the kind of science that we cover, that we're just doing a big broad scale dump of science, science is cool without actually serving people? Well, I see some things in some of the press and I think, I don't know what people are gonna make of that, I really don't. And the onus is on us all um, to, to actually help them with that. These might not be that. invalid stories, but it's how you help the public read them. That is an excellent point. Monica, you look like you wanted to say something. Well, it, it leads me to wonder whether the, um, the counterpart to um, Commissioner Moda's um, exhortation to tell the story is to also listen um, and you know, to really make a point to listen to our audiences about how we are serving them, about what they want to know. Um, I think any time that we do that, we find that they actually ask terrific questions that help us um, think of what we should be doing differently rather than, you know, deciding it from our desks. I just want to jump in and say, I think there's something about the way that science is reported in some cases. I mean, I'm sure you guys have all been on the internet and seen those, like, headlines that start with, like, science says, like, this is how you become, you know, a, a rock star or something like that. You know, like those clickbait headlines um, that we all see that, you know, in a lot of ways, I don't, they don't, um, they don't really get into the process of 
science, right? Science is not an absolute, it's a methodology, right? It's a way of, it's, a, it's essentially a system. And that system has processes and that system can, like, can correct itself. And the issue is like the trust deficit comes, like, this is to your point, when you know, somebody blasts something that says that's an absolute and then all of a sudden, you know, like, a year later, 10 years later, they start finding that that's not actually what happens. And I don't think we figured out how to tell the story of that corrective process within scientific discovery or exploration in a way that people outside can then, you know, outside of the different scientific fields can, can interpret and internalize, right? So it's, if you get up and, you know, somebody then reports that half of all these peer-reviewed studies can't be replicated, then people then will get up and say, oh shoot, well, science is totally invalid, but that's not necessarily true, right? It's just that it's the process that's, that's working that's allowing you to really dig down into the discoveries you're trying to make. I've always thought there was a culture conflict between journalism, which is event-driven, and science, which is a process. So that the way we tend to tell stories is event-driven. But that does, really doesn't do justice to the fact that really what the event you're talking about may best be a data and a long series of... And, and that's something we've always wrestled with. Jerome. Moi, je crois qu'on ne peut pas opposer les processus de la science et du journalisme. Il y a une démarche de la vérité dans le journalisme, comme il y en a une dans la science. C'est ce que je disais tout à l'heure, les méthodes peuvent se ressembler. Ce qui se passe, à mon avis, c'est que le journalisme a une tâche de vulgarisation scientifique. Je pense que le mot important a été donné, c'est que notre travail à nous, c'est de vulgariser. Et nous ne pensons pas assez, je pense, à vulgariser cette méthode scientifique, à expliquer quelles sont ses spécificités. Il faudrait plus que nous le faisons, à mon avis, euh, raconter la méthode en détail. Alors je sais que c'est un peu moins sexy que de raconter les découvertes, mais dans la crise actuelle, la crise de confiance que vous avez décrite, je pense qu'il est très important de pouvoir vulgariser ces processus euh, qui font que la méthode scientifique est quelque chose qui est un modèle de démocratie, en quelque sorte, puisqu'on peut à tout moment être soumis euh, à la vie de ses pairs. Il faut qu'il soit étayé, mais c'est un modèle de fonctionnement démocratique. Et c'est pour ça que je disais tout à l'heure, nous avons tout à gagner à continuer à défendre, à expliquer, à promouvoir cette méthode scientifique. Je pense que tant que de la bonne science est faite, et je pense que tant qu'elle est bien racontée, euh, nos pays, nos démocraties iront bien. La difficulté, c'est qu'actuellement, euh, justement, ça ne va pas très bien parce que c'est remis en cause. And maybe we find a moment right now in the, in probably the most relevant scientific discussion that we cover that, you know, really is going to determine the future of the planet to um, advance the understanding of this method um, and to help our audiences do what they really are eager to do and make up their minds for themselves with solid information rather than being told, you know, kind of the... Um, the end result that they, dis that, that, that they find is not that reliable. I mean, climate change really calls for an understanding of uncertainty of outcomes um, in a way that almost no other scientific story that we cover does. So we, um, we are pretty much called upon to figure it out now or never. That's a good point. Lem um, did you have, were you trying to jump in there? Well, uh, uh, only really to to say that, um, I mean, we employ an awful lot of people at the BBC covering science stories. We have a big science department, uh, and they're all sort of trying their best to sort of unravel it all for everybody. I think, I mean, what we see is that audiences, young audiences particularly, are incredibly interested in this subject. So we've got a real head start here, because we're not having any difficulty in engaging the audience. But I think that what we do have to do is try much harder about how we tell these stories in a really engaging way with a lot of different techniques to them, which unravels the, the um, you know, complexity of some of them. And, and I think that that's what really we have a, a responsibility to try to do. Sometimes I think that, that um, there's, there's possibly a bit too much peer-to-peer Uh, journalism, and we need to remember that it's the general public that are the recipients of this. Point. Yes, uh, we, um, I agree because we, we, we have to explain uh, that the world is complex, 
and complexity. And sometimes, uh, and I, I really like all, all the formats, uh, you know, physics in a minute and whatever, uh, but I don't know if anybody really did understand it uh, um, completely. And sometimes I think we have to take the, or we need to take the time to explain mm -hmm. and to explain this complexity and not just to say, oh, you know, it's simple, I can tell you in a minute. And and uh, this, I tell you in a minute, it's, it's sometimes just, in a minute it's funny and it's, it's, um, it's entertaining, but uh, I think we also have to do the effort why fundamental research is important. Because it, has, it lasts much longer, the research and then the, the effects and, uh, and, uh, and the results, and we have to, we have to do this. And we don't. I mean, I would argue to you that most publications regard basic or fundamental research as a luxury. That most of what we cover is applied science, science that is cha actively changing something in front of us, science that has a policy edge. I, if I picked a basic area of science, my personal favorite for some reason is condensed matter physics. But if I said to you, how many, you know, are you really into condensed matter physics? Are we going to look at some of the reasons why glass moves over 100 million years? Um, I think we don't do that. And so I think we do make luxury decisions about what we cover. I think we make decisions based on what we think people want to read. I think we make decisions based on um, climate change, issues that we think have some eminence. I, I think we make, we cut out areas of science all the time. So I, my, not necessarily wrongly, but I think we do. So my question to you, if we look at what we have all been saying here, that we need to tell science in a coherent and clear and well-explained way, that we need to not over-inundate people with uh, one of the things that I particularly hate, which is single study stories, which have really no meaning, that we need to really think about you know, the audiences that are coming up and trying to understand science. If we're not doing that well, isn't the problem you? Is the problem us as us. journalists? You're, yeah, it, the pro you're the editors. You run these very powerful networks. Are you not setting the standards that would get us right? I don't know about y'all, but no, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, that's all I had to say. Je pense qu'il faut il faut résister à ce que vous disiez tout à l'heure là. Il faut pas faire que de la science appliquée, hein, loin de là. J'essaye de faire en sorte qu'au monde. Le, le, le supplément science que nous publions chaque semaine soit très tourné vers la science fondamentale parce que il y a euh, là-dedans une, une profondeur, il y a une démarche qui est euh, extrêmement utile à mon avis à porter auprès du grand public. Alors il faut assumer, comme vous le disiez tout à l'heure, de ne pas pouvoir absolument tout expliquer. Mais ça aussi, ça se raconte aux gens, il y a, il y a, aux lecteurs. Il y a des lecteurs qui ne pourront jamais bien comprendre des détails très infimes, et nous-mêmes, nous avons du mal, et les chercheurs ont un peu du mal à les verbaliser. C'est comme ça. Aujourd'hui, ça fait partie de la science, mais je pense qu'il faut défendre dans nos journaux aussi la science fondamentale. C'est crucial, parce que euh, c'est euh, la science qui est celle qui met en marche l'intellect, qui met en marche euh, toute la, la, la vision philosophique aussi de la vie, et euh, je pense que c'est celle qui donne de la profondeur aussi euh, à nos existences. Et donc, pour les lecteurs, c'est important euh, de, de défendre cette science-là, pas seulement la science appliquée. I would just add a footnote, um, you know, Deborah, as you know, um, better than anybody in the United States, um, not only is science coverage period a luxury in many newsrooms, but journalism is becoming a luxury in many communities. Yes. And so whether we like it or not, we may also be faced with a situation where science coverage, the only science coverage that happens, happens in the context of other coverage so that the you know the sports reporter may find themselves touching on science and a mm -hmm. city hall reporter may find themselves touching on science in the context of an energy discussion and you know again it's, these are not um, not luxury questions that we can even answer anymore in the context of extremely finite resources yeah and I, I think it's okay to also say that not everything 
is newsworthy. And I think that's maybe part of what you get caught up in is like people trying to fill too much of a cycle where you do get these like minute explanations or whatever. You know, like as you said earlier, right, that some research just takes a really long time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like it's okay for it to take a really long time. And it, it doesn't have to be that you fill up everything with minute by minute coverage of, of X or Y. I do think that, you know, when you're dealing with finite resources, as you said, like you have to make choices. And I think that's where it becomes really important to think about what narratives exist already and how do we then essentially cherry pick information or stories to either confirm, well, mostly confirm, but confirm or debunk those narratives. Um, and that's where I think it gets a re tricky, right? And that's where I think you have to be very discerning and that's why I think it becomes absolutely essential to have a diverse set of perspectives in your newsrooms and, you know, on staff or whatever, because, you know, the way that certain parts of the world get covered, um, the way that science in certain parts of the world gets covered might fit into existing narratives. You might have stories or ideas or whatever that are coming from places that you just don't even know about because you don't have that perspective. And I think that, that becomes even more crucial when resources are scarce. Could not agree more. And we talked earlier, Natalie, about trying to balance limited resources with good storytelling. Is that a challenge that you think is worth discussing? Uh, yes, of course, because I think the financial situation is uh, for all of us uh, in, in uh, journalism all over the world is a, is a big discussion. And I think we have to to make choices. And I think uh, uh, the, to, to have a, sci a science department is um, essential for us. Um, to have it, and um, so we try to to bring them in all uh, all the other um, departments as well, their knowledge, and uh, to uh, to create better workflows. You know that the <coughs> that the knowledge um, the the other departments can participate, and uh, this is this is important for us. And we have uh, fortunately we have a, a quite a big uh, science department and. Um, I'm uh, happy to have them, and uh, I uh, will uh, do whatever it takes uh, to save them. <laughs> and they will be writing that down. I know. <laughs> so. well, ju just going back to your, I'm not a scientist, so just going back to your condensed, what was it again? Some Condensed something physics? What was it? Condensed matter physics. <laughs> right, okay. So uh, I think you lay down a good challenge here, which <laughs> uh, I think that we should pick up. Um, I'm, I'm all, I firmly believe in the ability to tell our audiences very, very complex stories. It's a lot easier around a strong news story. You know, uh, who would have thought that anybody would be interested in derivatives or collateralized debt swaps until the banking system went down? So, as you say, news is very helpful in uh, finding the peg. But, you know, if we can tell a story about condensed where whatever it was, <laughs> physics, <Very> matter physics. <laughs> then fine, let's, let's give it a go. Because I, I just think that the, you know, if it's important and the audience need to know about it, well, we should try. I'll just be emailing you about that. So, I, the two of you together made a really, I thought, interesting and important point, at least one that spoke to me, and that is, I'm a big believer in, in, in trying to cover science in everyday life. I think when we're trying to connect with people and not have them feel distant from science as if it's something that's done over here by people who think they're smarter than me, then when we're writing about the way science plays in your everyday life, we actually make a big difference. But the bigger picture, the philosophy of it, the way it challenges you to think, that's also an important part of what we do. I'm curious as to what kind of response you then get from your readers and listeners. Are there particular stories that you find your readers and listeners coming back and saying, more of that, please, or I would like to hear more of that, or please never do that again? Is there something that stands out for you, any of you? Uh, yes, uh, because we are developing some smart KPIs where we're not just... Uh, uh, or where we're not just uh, be focused on you know on the on the ratings and uh, the quotas, uh, but where we um, do or where we're doing some research for for smart KPIs for relevance, 
and uh, so we did some first testing and um, we got some results that, for example, the uh, people, they really, they like our science, uh, um, uh, uh, our science programs and uh, that they, um, they appreciate it and this is a much bigger value than just uh, uh, the quotas. Well, that's great to hear. What about, Jerome, you all were involved in a, a collaborative efforts looking at medical devices, um, which was a really powerful... What kind of response did you get to that? Did you do that just because they, you thought that it should be investigated, or did you see, were you hoping to actually affect change? Non, c'était vraiment euh, le, la recherche d'une information honnête sur des sujets qui n'avaient pas encore été beaucoup euh, investigués. Donc cette, euh, cette recherche sur les... Euh, vous, vous devez faire allusion aux implants médicaux de Implant Files, était le fruit d'une collaboration internationale qui a permis de mettre en avant des défauts qui n'avaient jamais été euh, recherchés euh, euh, sur tous ces, euh, tous, ces, tous ces implants qui, qui, qui sont mis... Euh, dans le corps humain, avec des protections qui ne sont pas suffisantes. Mais ce qui est intéressant là-dedans, je pense, c'est que nous avons euh, cette, euh, cette collaboration, cette enquête a été faite par des jeunes journalistes. Et je pense que nous avons actuellement dans la rédaction, en tout cas au Monde, mais je pense que c'est vrai de la, plus, de la plupart des autres rédactions, des jeunes journalistes qui aiment beaucoup la science, qui aiment beaucoup traiter des questions notamment climatiques, et qui savent aussi utiliser ce savoir-faire scientifique, cette utilisation des données qui savent, qui n'ont pas peur des chiffres, qui savent faire de la statistique, et qui du coup peuvent utiliser un savoir-faire scientifique pour faire du très bon journalisme d'un nouveau genre. Et là, typiquement, ce que vous citez, les implant files, c'était basé sur une exploitation statistique de chiffres, de données, euh, qui était énorme et qu'il fallait pouvoir gérer. Et je suis très content de pouvoir avoir ces nouveaux journalistes qui sont aussi un peu scientifiques, qui sont venus aux au, au journalistes par le goût de la science, et qui peuvent faire ces, euh, ces, ces, ces enquêtes-là. Et le retour du public est très bon, en réalité. Alors, euh, c'est très bon pourquoi Parce que euh, c'est fait d'une manière irréfutable. Et donc, on, tout le monde voit bien que ça n'est pas fait pour faire peur, mais c'est que vraiment, c'est quelque chose de très solide et de scientifiquement avéré. Donc, ces journalistes-là atteignent leur but, parce qu'on voit bien que leur méthode est totalement scientifique elle-même. Yes, and, and that goes back, I think, in part to our discussion of trust. I have a very different question for you, Monica, which is I was looking through your climate uh, science stories, and, and there have been a number of them that have dealt particularly with farmers. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there was one recently looking at the way that farmers in the Midwest are, are trying to make plans for flooding, they're growing cover crops, they're thinking about different ways to adjust to a, cl a changing climate, even though they don't use the words climate change. I was particularly interested in that because if you look across the landscape of American politics, the farmers are quite often cited as part of uh, our president's extremely loyal, 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 loyal base. So I'm curious, when, you, when you're focusing on farmers like that, do you have an a agenda in mind? Are you trying to reach them? Are you, are, are you trying to tell climate change stories in a way that people had... I'm, I'm just the whole kind of thought process that goes into reaching beyond the normal audience, I guess. I love that you saw those stories and, you know, credit where credit is due. We don't do this by ourselves. We are part of um, a collaboration of... Uh, more than a dozen news organizations around the world um, called the Climate Desk, um, and we exchange stories um, that we think each other's audiences will find interesting. This particular one, or this particular vein of stories about farmers in the American Midwest really coming to terms with the fact that the climate is changing right in front of them. It's not, it's not debatable to them. The, what's debatable to them is the politics of how um, how they describe it by virtue of needing to af needing to maintain their affiliation to a political community that's important to them, and so that's where that that's what makes it interesting. That's why we wanted to elevate the voice of a particular community that is grappling with this. Um, you know, to your point, that you really want to listen to people where they are 
um, rather than following your stereotype of how they are, how you might expect them to be in a red state in, you know, in a world that is often seen as only swinging one way. Yes. Yeah, I really like that. Now, you don't do climate change. You're much more focused on innovation and technology primarily, right? That's a deliberate choice. I do see drones in your publication. Right. I mean, I, I think the thing is, and this is to your earlier question, is mm -hmm. about sort of what excites your audience. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, again, some of the, the, the application of technology to some of the, the issues that people are facing in their daily lives that's what excites people, like seeing those stories of how phones can be used to do, actually, you know, you're talking about climate change, like helping farmers, for example, uh, sell goods better, sell their crops better, or like, you know, uh, dealing with like planting seasons and things like that. Stories of flooding in Lagos, for example. Um, you know, and I just think that it's really about what is, you know, the, I think one of the speakers earlier said about that, the emotional impact of the story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you'll lose a few spew facts and, facts and figures when somebody comes with sentiment, you'll lose every single time. And so I think it's really about, and this is to your point as well, like, how do you make it interesting? How do you marry those two things? And do you understand the people that you're speaking to, one? And two, do you recognize that you're speaking to a much broader audience than you think you are? Um, you know, if, you, if you're at the BBC, then you have the whole world. Um, if you're a publication in, in Nigeria, you might be looking at Nigerians first, but it's the internet. Everybody can read what you write, and you have to also think about that as you write. Ren, coming back to you for just a minute. In fact, when I go and look at BBC coverage, I, I see that the BBC does as well as anyone at actually looking at basic research. And I see really fundamental science mixed up with the applied science in a way that you don't see everywhere. But I know that you are, have just hired a global environment reporter and I'm wondering if, I'm, I'm sort of wrapping the climate change issues into this, if you're looking at the way you cover science, and, and this goes back to luxury and necessity, and saying, well, maybe we need to put more emphasis into this. This is the story that's driving the world right now. Maybe, and, and I'm completely anticipating your answer, but I'm curious as to what you might say. Well, yeah, I mean, yes, exactly. So this is a subject which is going to, as, as you said earlier, you know, shape the world. And we need to be approaching it from something which draws all the strands together of how the whole world is approaching it. So hence, a global climate, uh, a global environment correspondent. So that, that's the thinking behind it in order to be able to serve audiences both in the UK and internationally. Um, but just going back to your earlier question about what plays well with audiences, I mean, I'm always amazed, actually, by how it's the hardest things, quite often. The, the, um, the things that really sort of challenge your, your worldview, which sort of, sort of play well with audiences. Well, not, not challenge your worldview, but it's space, for instance, things which are really hard to explain. Uh, you know, how they how they've might have found another planet at the edge of the galaxy. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider, black holes, all these things do really, really well oh, with audiences. Looking so, good for condensed matter physics. Sorry. Looking good for condensed matter <laughs> physics. <laughs> We're going to make condensed matter physics a household word. <laughs> right. I mean, I think it shows that, you know, audiences really do want to be... Mm -hmm. this, these, this captures people's imaginations. And if you capture people's imaginations, then, you know, you can tell them things which they really, really want to know about. Yeah, that's a good point. Are we doing... I'm um, looking down at the organizers' questions from the audience. Do we have times to do that? No? We're really almost out of time. I'm really sorry, guys. I would like to ask each of you then to tell me this. Are you satisfied with the reporting of science in the mainstream media? Do you think that we have... You, you can pick your own platform. You can just look at it in general. But do you think we are doing justice to the subject at this point? 
No. Uh, I mean, I think we do pretty well at the BBC. We've got a lot of people doing it, and it, I fly the flag for, you know, properly funded public service journalism with the ability to invest in this. Others don't, necessarily. Um, and I think it's, it's almost also when the generalists get hold of it, you know, like me, <laughs> that the problems start to arise, uh, which is why one absolutely needs specialist journalists to interpret this. Great. We always can improve. Yes, that's <laughs> the golden rule of life. No, none of, and, and we're not going to do an adequate job for a while because none of the old rules apply, and we have a ton of learning to do right now. Au monde, la situation est plutôt satisfaisante parce que nous avons développé. Mais ce qui me rend toujours triste dans l'univers francophone, hein, je parle, c'est de voir des magazines et qui, qui ne vont pas bien alors qu'ils font du très bon boulot. C'est de voir des journaux qui ont fait baisser leur couverture scientifique, sans doute parce que c'est trop cher il y a quelques années. Et je pense que ce sont des choix... Euh, des choix dangereux et, euh, et j'espère que euh, ce genre de congrès comme aujourd'hui peut permettre de redonner de l'espoir à beaucoup de journalistes scientifiques pour faire changer les choses là-dessus. Um, and I would say I agree with everyone up here. I would just add that I would like to see more uh, diverse voices um, in terms of reporting um, the news on science. And that's an excellent way to kick this off. You guys were wonderful. Thank you. And thank all of you, and go have fun. Yes. Non <laughs> En fait, non. Enfin, vous faites, vous faites ce que vous voulez. Uh, don't have fun. No, 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 go and, no. Il uh, y en a déjà qui sont partis, uh, boire et manger. Il y a encore un tout petit, si vous voulez, hein, si vous aimez ça, il y a encore un tout petit moment avec nos amis du Yodler Club qui s'appelle uh, Alpenerösli. C'est chou avec les drapeaux et tout. Ils vont jouer du burel. Le burel, c'est comme un corps des Alpes, mais plié en trois. Et on m'a expliqué que le corps des Alpes faisait normalement un fa dièse et que celui-là, euh, un si bémol. Donc, euh, vous allez voir, c'est complètement différent. En tout cas, j'ai eu énormément de plaisir à partager cette cérémonie d'ouverture avec vous. J'espère que vous en aurez euh, tout au long de la semaine. Et puis... Une chose encore, pendant qu'ils enlèvent, vous avez vu comment on arrive à meubler pendant qu'ils enlèvent les fauteuils Eh bien, une chose encore, tous les soirs, le Congrès mondial scientifique vous propose de vous retrouver, si vous en avez envie, entre 21h et 1h du matin, pour ceux qui ne dorment pas. Il euh, y a comme un petit peu un social hub au Flon. Le Flon, c'est le quartier un peu de Lausanne. Vous prenez le métro en sortant. 10 minutes de métro, vous êtes au centre de Lausanne, et là, il euh, y a le hall BCV à côté de la haute école de musique. Vous avez tous reçu des plans, vous pouvez aller, on pense qu'à ça, boire des verres et faire un peu de réseautage, discuter avec des gens et des choses comme ça. Donc c'est tous les soirs de 21h, vous êtes prêts, hein j'ai meublé, de 21h à 1h du matin. Je vous laisse avec eux, et puis après, on se retrouve en bas et euh, on boit des coups ensemble. Au revoir, à tout à l'heure.